Okay, two microphones. And I, I really do appreciate uh, the way Dennis did that. That sets this up very nicely for all of us. And uh, I'm gonna, my talk's gonna be quite different. Uh, we, when we talked about this, I knew that Dennis would dig deep in the literature, give us a lot of data, and, and kind of bring us up to where we are in terms of scientific understanding of this concept. And I'm gonna give you a very different look at it. I'm gonna talk primarily from my perspective as an animal scientist, uh, but more than that as a farmer. And so I've, uh, I've been playing with this different uh, levels of, of grazing management for many years and have done some, uh, some demos that I think you'll be kind of interested in, some of the perspective that we, that, that we come out of that with. And uh, so with that, and actually, then she left me some extra time. So that's, uh, that was not expected. But we expect there will be a lot of questions and discussion that we'll go uh, into at the end. So uh, just as I start, I'll just follow up a little bit on that introduction. I am a beef uh, specialist at NC State. Uh, I've been working there for almost 27 years now. So uh, I've seen a lot of uh, fads come and go uh, along the way. And I was uh, born in South Boston, Virginia. Uh, spent my very early years on a farm uh, near a small town called Virgilina. And I farmed there during the 80s for several years and actually started strip grazing stockpiled fescue in 81, Chris, was the first year I did that. And if you guys can remember back that far, there was no poly wire, there were no tread in posts. Uh, and so it was a little different, little different ball game then and it was well worth the effort. And so with all of the technology and, and the benefits of, uh, of electric fencing that we have now, there's really not a lot of reason why folks uh, don't adopt uh, advanced grazing management type techniques. And so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more as we go through. But again, I do, uh, I do manage 110 cows uh, on the weekends and oftentimes at night. And uh, it's kind of amazing what happens to the behavior of a herd when you work with them on a nearly daily basis in terms of uh, providing grazing management uh, uh, to them. And so, uh, so I'll talk about that as a little bit as we get into this too. So I, I do want to review this definition. Uh, I think uh, Gary went through that very well, and, and, and Dennis, I think it held up. But uh, most people are talking about greater than 100,000 uh, pounds of live weight per acre, uh, stocking density. And one of the things that you hear a lot of people that actually practice mob grazing, and I'm going I'm to do something maybe uh, kind of off the plan, but how many of you in here consider yourselves to do mob grazing? OK, there are, there are a few in the room. And, uh, and so we work with a number of producers that, that, that are mob graziers. And, uh, and so this, uh, they start getting into a little bit of a debate sometimes of, well, OK, I'm 100,000. Well, I'm 200,000. And, and eventually, they, they work themselves up to a million, you know. And, and it, it's human nature, I think. But it is very possible to create yourself a system that you cannot manage, that you just cannot live with for the long run. And so we've got to keep that in mind that, uh, especially in this part of the world, most of us are part-timers, and you have to come up with a system that's going to work for you. So um, the, the one thing that we have observed, and I've talked to lots of these guys, that when they say uh, they're mob grazing, they actually are strip grazing. And, and this is, a, I, I kind of coined the term continuous stockpiling, but that's basically what it is. They're stockpiling all the pasture ahead of them. They're going into a pasture, cutting off a little corner of it near the water, and then strip grazing that pasture. And they may be in that pasture for seven or eight days or 10 days. Uh, and then they go to the next pasture and do the same thing. Now, the strip, the fresh strip that they give, indeed, that's a small piece of grass. And oftentimes, if you calculate the live weight per acre that's on that fresh strip of grass, it's at that 100,000 pounds. And if you do the math, in a country like this where we can have three or 4,000 pounds of available biomass out there, and you move once a day, then that, that 100,000 comes out of that equation. I mean, it's, it, 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 if you have that 3,000 3, pounds or so, I'll give you an example of that. But if you use the size of that fresh strip as the denominator in this calculation of live weight per acre, you come up with the 100,000. So uh, here's exactly what, what I'm talking about. I don't have a pointer, so I'm just going to have to talk without it. But in, in this, uh, let's just take an example, something many of us can relate to, that strip grazing fescue. Hopefully, if you're, uh, if, if you're a good grass manager, you're still grazing fescue this time of year. 
But oftentimes we'll measure about 3,500 pounds of available forage mass out there. Uh, if we're running a herd of 100 cows that weigh 1,250 pounds, uh, one, that's, you know, basically we give them a strip that equals one acre per day. Then that stocking density then, if you use just the fresh strip, is 125,000 pounds per acre. Now, if you go and you go onto a farm where they're strip grazing, you realize that by the seventh day they're in that pasture, the actual area available to the cows is seven acres, not one acre. And so those of us, again, if you go out and make those observations, you'll find that the cows spend most of their time on that fresh strip. And they may walk back for water, but if you present them with a fresh strip of grass every day, you'll see very little back grazing over that period of time. Very little. They, they like that fresh area. It's clean and they'll stay in that area most of the time. So the benefits of the mob grazing effect of them being grouped up and heavily impacting that new strip, you get that. But there is some, there is some extra area for them to get out of that. Now this is a very, to me, this is the most important concept that, that Dennis, you kind of said, we need to be going out there on farms, figuring out what people are really doing. Because if you have 100 cows confined to one acre of grass, where you put a back fence right up against them and give them that strip, and you have a day like today, that will be mud, an acre of mud. And it, and, and it can pretty much destroy the stand of grass that's there. Now what will happen when you move on, you go back to that area the next year, there will be vegetation there. This is very different than the West where we heard Courtney talk earlier this morning. Uh, this is not brittle country. I mean, it, something will grow back. But it will be stuff that's not the primary thing that we want in that pasture, maybe. Weeds, other stuff that, that we know uh, comes into the landscape. So, uh, so this, is a, this is kind of an important point, I think, for future discussion because most of the people that we work with that mob graze are really strip grazing. And, and I think a lot of the benefits are there uh, uh, with, uh, with some, uh, and, and you can help control for some of the problems you can have in this wet country when you get a, a heavy rain. Now this was uh, the other thing about that particular, I'll, I'll go on and say a few more words about that. The other thing is that's a much less labor intensive system than trying to back fence those cows. Because if you try to back fence those cows every day, then you've got to lane them back to water, you've got to lane them back to shade during the summer, or you have to have a system where you move a water tank every day. And as I talked to Jim Russell that was involved in that Iowa uh, state work that Dennis talked about, he, he hated that study. And so did the graduate students, because they were moving cows, water, and shade four times a day. And, you know, again, be careful what you say you're going to do, because it's kind of hard to keep up that uh, if you're a, a busy part-time kind of a farmer. So uh, let's go through and just kind of think about some of the things. This, this is pretty close to what Dennis talked about, but some observations I've met, obviously, uh, with mob grazing, you do extend this rest period, and I think the longer the rest period, the better from a lot of, a lot of standpoints. You do end up with some very deep-rooted type plants, um, reduced runoff, less selective grazing. Uh, you have improved manure and urine distribution. You have improved animal behavior. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Increased plant diversity. Improved observational and fencing skills by the manager. No question that that has to happen uh, or you will fail. And you have a lot of forage ahead of the cows. And that's probably the most beneficial thing to me as a farmer is I can look out 100 days sometimes and say, you know, if it doesn't rain, I can graze these cows for 100 days, okay? That's a huge advantage, but that's only good for cows. We grass finish about half of our calves. Uh, for a local market, and they don't do too good on that grass that's been growing for 100, 120 days. So it, it does depend on the requirements of your cows. Now, Dennis, I will say, if you look at that list and cross mob grazing off the top of that, that's the benefits of rotational grazing. Okay, so, so there's very few differences between what you would think about a, a good rotational system versus uh, versus something that would be much more intensive than, than what we're used to. Now let's talk about the negatives. The reduced nutritive value, uh, that comes out a little bit in the literature. Uh, certainly in fescue country, it's, uh, it, it can get pretty dramatic, the differences between the, that real old grass and, and the young grass. 
Uh, weed populations expand. We've seen this in, in, in a lot of people that we've worked with here uh, with, uh, with grazing systems simply, and I think it's because of that heavy trampling that can occur in wet weather. And, and if you've got a seed bank with cockleburr and pigweed and all that kind of stuff, uh, it'll come. It'll come. Now, uh, a lot of mob grazers say, well, that's feed too. They eat it, and, uh, and that's, that's just, that, that, it's not a weed if they eat it, right? And so we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Grazing behavior results in uh, weed and toxin consumption. No doubt about that. These animals become very unselective in what they eat, and they'll eat a lot of stuff that you may not want them to eat. I mean, they, they learn that they, they're going to eat everything in that, in that, in that little paddock, and uh, they, they will eat some stuff you may not want them to eat. Have seen uh, small calves trampled, so this is not something that I think you want to do during calving season because typically in a rotational uh, system where you're, you're doing this, the cows are very aggressive about getting into that new piece and eating their share before the others do, and if there's baby calves bedded down in that deep grass, uh, they get stepped on, and, and we have had that happen in a number of cases, so just one of those things that you got to think about. Clearly, not all cows adapt to being crowded into a tiny little spot with a single strand of electric fence. And most people that work with these, they, they have a solution to that. Mike, those cows got to go to town. They got to go live somewhere else because there are cows that uh, just are jumpers and they will jump that fence. And once they start doing it, uh, everybody else thinks about it. Uh, the lack of flexibility, again, if you say, I'm going to keep my stocking density at a million or better, and that's my goal in life, good luck. Good luck. What happens the day you wake up with the flu? You know, you better have somebody that knows what you're doing that can get out there because those cattle got to be moved that day, no matter what. High labor and fencing costs, depending on how you construct your system, very, very advanced skills are required, and many of our producers don't, don't have those skills yet. And my big thing is the very idea limits somebody that's continuous grazing from doing the first step of going to rotational grazing. When they go to one of these seminars and they hear somebody say, if you're not at 100,000, you are wasting your time, a lot of them go home and say, I can't get there. There's no way I could ever get there. So they don't do anything. And I think that that, in my, uh, in my experience, that's been one of the worst things that we've seen happen. Now, I will refer you to this, uh, this review that uh, Dennis talked about, a lot of the papers that are mentioned in this review by, uh, by Jim Russell uh, that, that came out of Iowa State. That's published in Journal of Animal Science in 2015. Gen some general observations from that are that uh, there are some improvements in soil organic carbon, water infiltration, reduced erosion, and plant diversity with improved grazing management from continuous grazing. Very few differences could be found between mob and rota rotational stocking. Uh, but again, as Dennis said, there's just not that many studies, and, uh, and there's probably some subtle things there that we, that we just don't know. But certainly, a review of the literature does not come up with a big uh, conclusion that mob grazing uh, is really a big benefit over rotational grazing. And I think that what Dennis talked about um, followed that up very well. Now, the story, uh, the story for me started with our pasture land ecology school that we do for NRCS every summer. Uh, this, uh, that we have a group of around 30 uh, grassland uh, specialists from across the country that come to Raleigh for, a, for a basically what is a, a two-week pasture ecology school, grazing school. Each of those groups gets a small uh, group of cows or sheep or goats or horses to work with for that period of time. And uh, one year, about, uh, it's been about eight years ago now, one of the groups had a mature group of Angus cows, had 30 cows in that group, and they decided they want to do this mob grazing thing. This is when mob grazing first came out. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to do mob grazing. Okay, so they worked through that, uh, that example, and we had lots of discussion around that. And they got down to where this 30 cows needed two-tenths of an acre of pasture. And they, and they got it down to that. Uh, by the end of that two-week school. And uh, in our final discussion, and this is Dr. Jim Green right there, if you don't know him with the, with the big hat on there, but he's, uh, he's uh, my uh, collaborator in that project. But uh, we were walking around doing the final review of all of our grazing groups, and that group, uh, and there may be people in this room that were in that group, I don't know, but they basically said, okay, we really like this. And uh, 
we hate to see it stop. So what's going to happen when we leave? And I said, well, you know, the farm manager is going to come take down all these fences, and these cows are going to have the rest of this pasture for about a week, and that's just kind of the predominant management s system here. So they said, well, we were afraid of that. So Dr. Poor, how far from here do you live? I said, about four miles. <laughs> so they said, okay, uh, we think you ought to keep this going. And I, I was like, oh, my gosh. And they said, well, didn't you tell us, you know, it's a good way, you know, if you live right by your cows, go spend a few minutes with them every morning and move them and <laughs> talk to them. And, you know, we've heard you say that. And I said, yeah, I did. I, I believe I did say that. <laughs> so I started in. So I, so I, I, I took up the challenge. And I won't, I won't go on and on because of the time. But certainly I started, uh, I started moving those cows. And I realized I didn't know a whole lot about putting up electric fence and, and all of the, the challenge that was ahead of us. And I actually, uh, I actually got a lot out of it. And the first observation I made was those cows were very unhappy the first few weeks of that process. They were butting each other, fighting. They did not like being this close to another cow. So if another cow came and ate right with head right next to them, they'd swat at her and they'd kind of fight a little bit. Well, after about two or three weeks, that changed. The cows would stand and wait for me to show up and give them the fresh piece of grass. And then they would put their heads down and they would eat aggressively, nearly touching each other with their heads. And not even, not, and no stress or, or any of that involved. They started to eat things that I had never seen them eat. This, this uh, mid-May shot down there of cows eating seed heads, when they go in two tenths of an acre and there's 30 cows and they realize this is what's for for, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner today, they will eat every bit of it. And so do you want them to eat that stuff? I mean, that's, that's a question. This is back to that toxin thing. But as the, as the demo went along, and I kept this up for two years, um, virtually every day I was there. When I wasn't, I had a grad student or something that moved the fence I'd set up. And, uh, and I noticed after a while, they really were starting to eat things. I just couldn't believe that they would eat. So Jim Green came out one morning with me and and I wanted to show him this, and we, we went and we, we, we staked out a big patch of horse nettle, which is one of our favorite uh, weeds there that just loves our grazing systems. And that's, uh, that's after a one-day graze with, a, uh, with about, a, a, about 125,000 is, is what our, our stock density was. And you can see they will eat stuff that you would normally not think they would eat. Now, we tested that, that horse nettle, and it was 16.5% crude protein. And the TDN was, uh, you know, I'm not, we can't estimate it because there's no data on digestibility of horse nettle, but it's pretty high. Now, if they had to eat nothing but that, they'd probably starve to death, okay? But a few bites of that along with everything else, and uh, it probably doesn't limit their intake and, and, and may be a beneficial piece. So again, Mike, if they eat it and it's, it, it's in the pasture and they get nutritional value out of it, I believe it's kind of challenges what's a weed. Now some things they won't eat. This is milkweed, obviously. They do nibble a little bit on it, but they do stomp the heck out of it. Now, um, we, as we went around, this is the second summer, we got into a bad drought there in Raleigh, and we had a pasture that had been used for self-feeding calves, and it had been a big mud hole a lot of times, and it was full of weeds, and they were getting ready to bush hog it, and I asked the manager if, uh, if we could go ahead and take that area and use it with the cows, because we were about out of grass on the pastures we'd been using. And so, uh, so we did, and, and uh, this group of cows is very easy to work with. They move right in, and they, they do a good job. So this is uh, kind of the way we do it. And I like this picture, because it shows things that we've learned. The, the rigid post there is a, is a fiberglass post that's uh, UV stabilized, works good for corners, building lanes, and that sort of thing. Very, very important for me to make these systems work. Uh, good quality reels, good quality wire, a lot of power on the fence. And those are some things that you've just got to have to make it work. So this is looking back down the hill from uh, the same spot as we're looking up right there. The cows uh, very quickly move in and, and, and utilize this material, eat aggressively. And, uh, and then this is the next day. So uh, the cows are there at the top of the hill where they, you just saw them in that previous shot. They're very full, very content waiting for me to come give them that next piece of, of uh, lamb's quarters was the predominant species in this particular case. 
Uh, but there was grass down under that, and, and they, you can see they were stripping them down. Now, this was getting a little bit old and woody. They didn't need all the stems. Uh, and they don't necessarily stomp everything down, even though these did truly have a back fence and were, were uh, forced to stay in that small area. Now, this is a little hand-drawn map I made at the time, but we ended up getting 24 days out of this 4.7 acre pasture. Mind you, this was in the middle of a summer drought when there were no, growing no grass elsewhere on the farm. Uh, average was about 2.2 acres per day, 33 cows. You can see that was actually 214,500 uh, stock, stocking density uh, at, at any one time, 184 cow days per acre, uh, and we got over two tons of, uh, of effective yield out of that. That's what the cow swallowed. Now, if you look at the, I, I really need the pointer for this, so you'll have to stick with me, but if you look at the dotted lines that are below the water and along that shade line, that is where our temporary lane was. So you've got to realize that to do this, you've got to do a lot of laning, and if you're working only with one water source and limited shade, you have to plan around this. But that was the order. The numbers there are the order of the days that we were in there. And uh, it was pretty amazing that we did get that much out of a pasture that was perceived as just a wasteland that was going to be bush hogged. So, uh, very, you know, there are times, Gary, when you can use this uh, much, uh, you know, to great, uh, great advantage. But you can see the amount of setup and, uh, and labor that goes into this, but it's not that bad. Once you get good at it, uh, you can really do a good job. Now, some of the things we learned, Paige, it does matter which end the reel is on and stuff like that. So uh, just to run you through a little bit of an of a, of a, uh, of a, uh, animation here of how you set up the, the wire and how uh, you open the gate, move the cows into that first piece. Then uh, second day, this is pretty cool. I didn't know this was going to run on its own. But. So be, basically each of these little paddocks is uh, two tenths of an acre, and uh, we, we end up with about three acre pasture. We'll get 16 days out of that. Now, it takes four reels to do this, and each of those little white nodes is where we have one of those rigid uh, fiberglass posts. But a lot of this can be set up ahead of time, and that's kind of the, the, the take home message. If you're going to do this and back fence them, you are going to have to do quite a bit of set up ahead of time because uh, you don't necessarily every day want to be. Um, putting up fence, but you can set it up ahead of time. So pretty effective, but you do have these temporary lanes. You do have a lot of impact on that water source, but it, you know, the point is it can be done, but it takes some real, uh, it takes some real fencing skills to do that. Now, the final thing I want to say about this is really the big change to me is the change in the animal performance. And this is a little, this is another herd we worked with there on the farm, and these were strip grazed rather than being paddock grazed or confined grazed like that, uh, that last group. And uh, this is Bermuda grass, Dennis. So this is, again, a good example of if you start uh, you know, doing this on, on, on warm season grasses in the south, you're going to have some pretty low quality stuff. But these cows very, uh, very aggressively go in, eat that stuff way better than they would if they were wandering around in a continuous grazing system. And the real remarkable thing is that this kind of behavior sticks with these animals. So as you go to a less intensive system, they still have that mob mentality. They still stand close together. They still uh, have that unselective grazing that, that they do. So you still can get that, uh, get that out of the system with a little less uh, confinement like you would have in a true mob grazing situation. Now, I'm going to tell you, doing this on home, at home as a farmer is a real challenge because there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be added. And certainly, you have to think about water, shade, and fencing to be able to, uh, to make this thing uh, really, really work for you. So you've got you to be a little bit concerned about that as you, uh, as you set up a system. And, and again, if you think about it, in the south, especially this country with fescue, putting cows in a small paddock without shade during the summer, you just can't do that. You have got to have some shade or some uh, other considerations. And so a lot of laning and a lot of walking, Dennis, and I don't know how that extra walking came in that one paper, but our cows that, that we had there at NC State walk a lot because they have to walk back to shade, they have to walk back to water uh, when we're in situations where we don't have adequate of that.
Now, I'm going to tell you a couple little things here that we've been doing that, that might be uh, a place where this tool actually does work. And so this is, uh, this is some work that we've been doing with uh, summer grazing uh, of, of summer annuals for soil building and fescue conversion. And a number of people in the room are involved in this project. This is actually one of the on-farm uh, uh, demo things that we did very early on in the program. And the idea here is to get some value out of of grazing summer annuals while we are killing off fescue pastures. And uh, Gary, this is not how you want to ma manage sorghum Sudan for maximum performance on cattle. But that is, the cattle feed part is only one of the things we're trying to do here. If you're trying to smother fescue, this is the way to do it. Okay, if you go into sorghum Sudan when it's thigh high and graze it down, there's going to be some fescue, and especially some common Bermuda, that's going to survive through that system. In this kind of a system, it doesn't, it, it doesn't happen. Okay? So, so uh, it's very good from that standpoint, but also for potential soil building and getting organic uh, carbon built up in some of these old, tight uh, fescue sods that, that, that we have that, that could use some renovation. So this is, uh, this is basically the same, uh, the same field. This is getting ready to set up a strip of, of electric fence. And when you graze these types of systems, you learn that uh, you, know, you have got to have somewhere to put the electric fence. And so a lot of people will bush hog a path there. Uh, I, I started doing this, and I kind of like this. This is a bush hog that's not running. It's just simply being used to, to mash down that tall grass so that we can put up the wire. And, uh, and then this is, that, this is that path that was created. The poly wire is there on, up against the face where, the, where, where my nephews are. This actually is on our home farm. And the cattle are going to come into that big stand of sorghum Sudan. But the good thing is when they, when they kind of get in there and freak out and start to come back out uh, the other end, they're going to at least hit that open area and realize, wow, there's a fence down there. I better stop. So, so you do have to do some planning around this. But you can see in the foreground, uh, land that has been grazed that was, that, that was equally that tall. Uh, they do eat a lot of this material, but they, they stomp a lot down. They, they do create a lot, a big mat of organic matter on the soil. And, uh, and we actually have some, you know, we've got some uh, research on farm in several different locations where we are looking at what's going on with the soil uh, in these kind of systems. So this is, uh, this is basically that same field. It's a little bit later time. Uh, point, but you can see the the what we, if you want to call it, the mob grazing effect of how they they, they mob down that uh, that material, and uh, and they're going into the fresh uh, the fresh grass there at this point. Now people all, all the time ask perfor about performance. Performance in these systems for us has been somewhere between a pound and a quarter and a pound and three quarters per day on growing cattle. Not too bad if you look at the literature on sorghum Sudan. Really well managed stuff. You're going to be in that one. 0.7, maybe 1.9 range. So pretty good performance considering, but, but the thing to think about, this is BMR 6 Sorghum Sudan. So it does have some advanced, uh, some enhanced adjustability at a, at a higher level of maturity. And so uh, there also is, uh, this particular one is, uh, is one that is photoperiod sensitive. And this is a late summer shot where it does finally start to put out a seed head. But, uh, but it, it can get a lot taller and stand up a lot better than some of the other uh, older varieties that we have. Now this, uh, this effort, uh, we, we started this with a number of different farms and, and it's a long, long story, but one of, our, one of our great farm cooperators was Johnny Rogers, who's uh, up near Roxboro, North Carolina, north of Raleigh. And, uh, and, and Johnny really caught on to this thing. He, he really kind of liked it and we started asking him to go around and talk to other farmers and stuff. And, and so he's, uh, he's now working with us as the, as, the, um, as the coordinator of the Amazing Grazing Program. So we're really glad about some of the connections that we're making with farmers to try to get more of our research out on the land and, and some of these, uh, some of these uh, interesting kind of demonstrations. Now this particular case is a farm that's up in the mountains uh, in Clay County, which is basically due north of Atlanta and south of Chattanooga. It's a gentleman named Bass Hyatt. And Bass has always been a, a, um, a very uh, deep thinker and looking at new production systems. And he did the mob grazing thing for a number of, uh, of years. And he did, it was the strip grazing approach that I talked about. But nevertheless, uh, the continuous stockpiling and strip grazing. And he saw his weaning weight on his calves drop by about 80 pounds 
over a two-year period. And so two years of that, and he said, uh, you know, I got to back off of this. I'm going to go out of business. And so he has gone now to a, where in the wintertime, he uses a very, very intensive strip grazing system. And then in the growing season, when he's got calves on the cows, he uses more of a rotational stocking system on that same farm. And so, uh, so he basically does it more as a, more of a lax rotation the first two times around. And then the last time around, third time around for the year, he strip grazes on into the winter. And, uh, and that system has worked well for him. But this particular field,